Um, okay, hello everyone, and welcome to this very informal discussion about uh, the second edition of John Company. Now, I thought about like preparing a real talk. Um, I did, uh, but I I just I hate to like. I hate to bury something before it's done. And so rather than writing up a full talk or anything like that, I just wanted to talk about more informally and have a discussion about the development of John Company, which we've been showing this weekend, and uh, which is currently looking on schedule for crowdfunding uh, early next year. And ideally, you know, something that hopefully we can maybe deliver to all of you by the end of next year if things go well we, we don't we all of the schedule stuff is highly 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 speculative um, who knows what next year looks like uh, all bets are off um, but drew um, has done a great job managing the premier uh, fulfillment and Kickstarter and it's like pretty much done uh, and so we are off working on um, working on John Company. Now, we've actually been working on the second edition, edition of John Company since right about when we finished with Premier, and I'll show you some of the very early stuff. Uh, and we had thought about yoking the John Company uh, Kickstarter to the, the Premier Kickstarter we did last spring, and it just wasn't quite like ripe enough. It like wasn't ready. And we had this meeting where Drew uh, drove up from Chicago. He came to the, the Twin Cities, and we were we were working on it. And just after we had a little like soul search, we were like, well, we could hustle in a month and like put this out and get this ready for crowdfunding and then just do it all at once. But Drew reminded me that we structured this company so that we don't have to exhaust ourselves. We can take our time and that this was a perfectly reasonable place to take our time. Um, so what I want to do today, I've got like an hour. Um, I, I, that, that always seems like an impossibly long time, but We'll just see how we do, and then I'll try to reserve like at least 15 or 20 minutes at the end to take questions. Uh, a reminder to people who are with us on Discord, um, if you say anything, it will be broadcast on Twitch, and we'll end up on YouTube. So if you don't feel comfortable, you're by all means, you're, you're fine to unmute and ask me a question when we get there. Uh, but if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can put it in text, and Drew will relay it to me. And I'm going to be um, uh, keeping an eye on the Twitch channel. Uh, Drew, um, can I give you a very small task to do while I get started? Can you yeah. post our Twitch link to the Whirly Gig Discord and to the Woodland? Oh, yeah. yeah no, not to Whirlywood, but uh, not to the Whirly Gig, not to Woodland Warriors. Uh, but I'm, I mean, I'm happy to have anybody on Woodland Warriors. That's fine. If you have an oath question or a root question, hit me. But um, I don't want to, you know, I try to keep my day job and my weekend job separate. Um, okay, so uh, John Company, the origins of John Company. So the origins of John Company started in 2008, um, when, uh, which was right when I was finishing um, my undergraduate years. I had just started getting really interested in the British Empire, and I just learned about uh, the existence of the East India Company. You know, one of the books, I, I don't think I've mentioned this anywhere, but uh, right when I was finishing my, my undergrad, I happened to uh, get a copy from the library used book sale of Moorcox, I think that's the guy's name, uh, The White Nile, which blew me away. And I had never really, like, thought about the British Empire, like, as a subject. Um, I Well, I had thought about it as a subject, but only in the 20th century context. And The White Nile just kind of shook me. It was a really brilliant book. Uh, and then that led to a million other things. So I had Empire on my mind a little bit. And then, um, you know, the year after I finished college, uh, my wife and I were living in a place called Heltonville, Indiana, which is on the southern coast of Lake Monroe. And uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. I was working as a social worker, and I missed playing games and when you don't have a game group the thing you fantasize about is playing like the most multiplayer games possible the biggest i think, I think everyone is feeling that okay. yeah it's like i i mean i i just got a copy of versailles in the mail um the you know herman's new game and and uh jeff egglestein's and i am so excited and i was extra happy to get it uh even though i don't know when i'm gonna play it but and i normally am not I'm not bad about that. I normally play the games I get, but there was an exception. Anyway, I didn't have a group for a while, and so there was one game I wanted to play, Republic of Rome, so bad. I wanted this. I wanted to play this game so bad. I, I you know, I, I coveted it. Um, and th this game was so hard to find at this time. 
Uh, copies on eBay were, were going for a lot of money. The Valley Games reprint like hadn't happened yet. Um, and so, but I just wanted it so bad. And in fact, I, I wanted it so bad that I went to Gen Con and I, I, I sat in the auction all day hoping to find a copy. And one came up and someone beat me to it. They beat me to the copy of Republic of Rome that I wanted. And I remember um, the feeling of like, well, I was thought I was going to spend my $80 or something on a, a used copy of Republic of Rome, but I don't have it. So I'm just going to wander the Gen Con floor. And at this point, I had no like inclination to be a game designer. It wasn't something I was thinking about seriously or really even at all. But in retrospect, there was an obvious hint because I walked this entire Gen Con hall and I wanted anything, any substitute for Republic of Rome, any like pale, pale imitation of it. And I couldn't find anything. There was like nothing that was even like 10 degrees, even, a, you know, 80 degrees away from Republic of Rome. The closest I got was uh, this game called <laughs> Mechanisburg, um, which is actually called Mechanisburgo. The, the, that O is like hidden in the graphic. Uh, and what, what got me about this game, what, on the back it described how all the players had to work together to defeat some common enemies, but there were also like places for tomfoolery and this game is not good it's full of great ideas uh, but like it doesn't quite work together and I remember getting it and trying to play it and realizing that it was not it just wasn't Republic of Rome it wasn't the thing I was looking it wasn't for Re though the cover is similarly as striking yes now I was so wild about Republic of Rome that I, I built a copy or rather I, I found a, a used copy that was incomplete and then completed it and and had like I I forced my friends from all over to, to come join me at my little house on the lake and we, we played a game of Republic of Rome and it was wonderful. I mean, this is like 2009. Yeah, yeah, you were, I think you might have been there, Drew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, what a wild thing. And so around that time, I, I wrote some notes to myself that like, hey, I kind of want um, a game like this, but I wonder if it has to be about like a, like a city-state like, maybe you could do it about the East India Company. Maybe this is, like, a way of, of, of approaching uh, this, th this, th this problem. Um, but I, I tucked that note in a box and didn't think about it for a long, long time. Now, um, after my, my time at university uh, at Indiana, I, I kept reading about the British Empire. I continued to study it, and I kept thinking about the problem of a game about the British East India Company. One of the reasons why it seemed like a good subject for me is because it was like fundamentally confounding. Um, it didn't like the later. I don't want to make this into a long uh, talk about empire, but the later British Empire makes a lot of sense. Uh, it practices in general a pretty like logical realpolitik when it, when it comes to the decisions it makes. And I'm talking here about the period from like 1880 to like maybe like 19, but before the World War II. It like, the empire largely behaves uh, evilly, but also like rationally, and if you consider the fact, its inputs. Um, the period before that, what we might think of as like the earlier imperial period, uh, it doesn't behave reasonably at all. Uh, it, it's very reluctant. It, it is fundamentally contradictory at all these different points. And so I was very interested in uh, how, how the East India Company worked how it came to be the thing that it is and what, you know, the kind of road that it followed to get to that point. And uh, f folks who follow my work might know that whenever I run into a historical topic that doesn't really make sense to me, that's the kind of stuff that like fires me as a designer. It fires my mind and gets everything kind of going. So I, you know, I continue kind of learning about the uh, East India Company. And then um, after Pax Premier happened, um, uh, I did a little expansion to Pax Premier called Kyber Knives. Uh, I was going to get a copy. I have, I have it around here. Um, so I did an expansion to Kyber Knives. And then that summer, uh, Phil wrote me a, a note, wrote me a message, and said that they, or no, it wasn't that summer, it was that spring. And he said it was selling really well, and he wanted to reprint Pax Premier with Kyber Knives included. And I actually had forgotten this had happened, but I was going through my old emails and found this email chain. And I had told him that I was unsure about that, uh, that I thought I had largely tapped out the audience for Premiere. I couldn't imagine more than a few thousand people, a couple thousand people would be interested in a game about Afghanistan. 
Uh, but I was I was actually thinking about doing the doing a game about trade monopolies, and I wondered if he would um, be interested in it if, if I were to make that game. So in the first proposal. Uh, this is the kind of game John Company was. This is the very first, this is the cover uh, image, sorry for the pixelization, that I sent Phil uh, as part of a teaser email for John Company, um, which I imagined as a game with a much larger scope. It was going to be about the, all the British charter companies, not that just the East India Company, and how it related to the, the creation of the, of the new English gentry and the new money. Um, and I was very intrigued by by, by this project. Phil was super uh, supportive and basically said, hey, if you make anything that works, I'll publish it. Um, and I thought that I was well on my way. Um, so oh, this was your first like pitch to Phil Eklund and Sierra Madre after after Pax Premier and after Kyber Knives? Yeah, after Kyber Knives. Yeah, because he wanted to do a, he wanted basically to do a second edition, a collector's edition of Premier. And I was like, it's too soon. And also this isn't exactly how I want Premier to look. And what about this thing instead? And Phil was like, okay, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, Phil, at this period, uh, I'm talking about Phil Eklund, who um, formerly the owner of Sierra Madre Games. Now Sierra Madre Games is partnered with Ion Games. Um, and, uh, you know, th there was a funny thing where uh, at this period, he was really looking for partners who could design with him because he had extra capital and he had publishing bandwidth. And so he wanted to get, you know, find games to, to publish he wanted he would love to publish two or three games a year um uh someone m m mentioned in the chat uh that their white whale is warrior knights i share that white whale i've played warrior knights now several times and it's awesome it's a great game um blood royale is also um <laughs> is also in that same mode um yeah th this is i should say this time i was like learning uh how to do this is like around the same time as i was working on infamous traffic and so I was like learning how Illustrator worked. This might have been like the first "quote unquote" cover I ever built in Illustrator. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just I was just trying to make a pitch deck. Now let me show you some pieces from this game. Um, I thought, you know, Phil's whole model, and this is I'm sorry for people on the Discord chat, but you can just imagine what I'm going to say. Phil whole, Phil's whole model is built on these like tiny little uh, box games. If you own the first edition of Pax uh, Perfuriana or Premier, you know about these small little boxes. Uh, these boxes for a while, uh, DHL would send this anywhere in the world for five euros, a box this size and at this weight. And so I first thought that, Adra, you're looking around for right. one. Um, I, I, I first thought that um, maybe I could make all of John Company work in a small box. And so I had it built in this like placard, uh, placard system. So here's a placard right here. So here's the East India Company, the full East India Company. Look at that on a single, a single <laughs> board. Uh, there's gonna be spelling errors. None of this makes any sense, probably. Um, the map pieces looked like this. We had empty ships and full ships. The dice did something, I think. I can't remember. Um, here's the London board. Uh, we have you know arms you can buy, ships and goods. Uh, you know just the kind of general like, hey, look at how much stuff I'm gonna stick in this game. Uh, and Phil said, hey, this is a great concept. Go for it. And I said, all right, I'm going to go for it. Uh, Do you still have like, like rule, like rules outlines from, from that like first pitch? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, one, uh, yeah, actually here I will, uh, I'll show you a couple other images. I had like a lot, I've been, I've been collecting like weird archival images. Here's an image of Nabobs. Um, Incre incredible! Yeah, look, I have, look, oops, I sorry, not, I had not seen this uh, this archival poll. Oh yeah, no, I've got a lot of these, just like uh, weird, these like out. weird uh, caricatures. Um, and then you know, like of course, it wouldn't be complete if there weren't like I was thinking about chair design for the pieces, and there, there's this. So like uh, that image that I shared of all these guys in the top, I shared this with chat right before the stream started. Uh, that top part is the Englishman in November, and the bottom part are Frenchmen in November. Um, so you can get you know this is the, the the oldest saw in British humor is comparing themselves to the French. Okay, now do I have any of the outlines from that time? I absolutely do. Uh, here is a rule book from probably like a couple months. This might be the first John Company rule book. Uh, and it's from a couple months after I sent Phil that, that pitch. 
and it's you know I've, I imagine you could more or less play a game um, the parliament cards like parts of this game were wildly complicated like there were parliament cards that had like industry subsidies and budgets on them and all sorts of you know it was very you weren't just passing a single law there were all of these systems that were interrelating um, we have the London season you can um, oh yeah which, uh, I, I love seeing that that uh, the London season section uh, as influenced than future uh, infamous traffic to come. Yep, yeah, yeah, yep. And then like this, like you, you could you could send on uh, what is now the open trade, um, what is now the open trade mission, uh, or or was the open trade mission in John Company used to be a diplomatic missions. You could incite border wars or try to improve status or just try to make general conduct contact so you have all this stuff and then right even in this early draft this nine page draft we've got company um deregulation uh and i'll just i'm gonna highlight this this sentence that i just read um pawns on the board of directors in the case of deregulation pawns on the board of directors are returned to their players so So sad sad. (laughs) (laughs) so you know a lot of that kind of tomfoolery now um the very first play test kit uh, was from that summer, and I'll show y'all what it looked like. Here it is. Here's some event cards. Oh, Parliament's in session. It's got a budget. There are different things that you can vote on. And I really, I imagined that the Parliament phase would be a lot like that phase in Republic of Rome where, like, a lot of laws can get passed and you can try to, like, bundle laws together. I would love to make a game about British parliamentary politics someday because they're wonderful and, like, do a 19th century political game. Uh, but, boy, John Company has already got too much too much going on. Um, so we got these event cards... Um and note like you things you don't want the you don't want the law passing phase to follow Robert's rules cool yeah exactly know. right but, you know every game comes with a, co- a gavel and a copy of Robert's rules um so then uh you know we have stormy seas and we have these uh, there was this like weird action card system which was like kind of cool and I might use it for a different game but it ended up working um we have office cards these are the prizes British newspaper um. And then here, here's India and China and the Levant. Now, I just drew one map. You might notice all those places look the same. Um, <laughs> I just drew one map to just, just get started. Uh, and then here are the different monopolies. You could you could start or participate in the East India Company or the Hudson Bay Company or the Levant Company uh, in this very early draft. And I And then, of course, they had their unregulated sides right at the start, right? This is a core element of play. Now, uh, wh- wh- one thing I'll, I'll say about some of this stuff, uh, and, and, you know, Drew, of course, feel free to, t- any any questions that come up in Discord, let me know. Um, wh- one thing I'll say about all these, all th- th- this crazy draft is I set up this game. I remember I had a friend over, um, and we played it, and it was just so broken. It was so clearly, like, unworkable right from the start. But I was undeterred, and a couple months later, I made a kind of 2.0 of the system. Here it is. So you can see there's some minor graphical improvements. We now have offices, the emergence of the office cards. Well, and when just... I, see a tre- I see the first treasuries <laughs> that look somewhat similar. Yeah, there you go, right? First, tre- the notion of treasuries. I actually, so it's funny about treasuries. I had originally, there was a cut of Pax Premier where players uh, could hold money. But not very much. And then most money was located in cities. And so, like, it wasn't on the market cards. It was on cities. And, like, it, I don't know, it didn't really work. But I I wanted, like, the um, liquidity of a city, the amount of species moving through that that city was really important in Afghan history. So I wanted there to be, like, oh, yeah, in this city there's plenty of money. In this city there's not a lot of cash around, so you have to, like, use different forms of leverage. It didn't end up working in Premier at all, but, you know, that's another story. Um, so a lot of stuff here, though, that's, like, pretty similar. Uh, and then we've got these prizes, the fancy house, the fancy hat, of course, um, very, you know, various things like that. Um, and then here we have our maps of India. There's Canada, Indonesia. Um, now, this thing, I can't remember how this worked, but basically this was a world where uh, you, when you started a company, you just grabbed this placard, and there was like a funny little rondelle thing. Um, and this actually worked. I remember playing this game a couple of times, uh, and it seemed somewhat interesting. Uh, and that led to, uh, I'll show you here, um, what 
kind of like the version 6. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, I, I need to rotate this so that it's not... I'm staging things on my other screen. Pause, please. Uh, here we are. Um, so this led to stage uh, to, to version 6. And this game I played a lot. So here I dropped the images. I was like really unsure of how I wanted this all to look. Um, actually, I just realized um, I'm going to do something I normally wouldn't do, which is I'm going to uh, find something that I oh, wanted that I wanted to include, but I forgot. Um, well, I'll, I'll take this moment because when you flash that first uh, placard of the first instance of um, of the company overview. Uh, right on the on the single placard for your first pitch, uh, I loved the comment from uh, uh, on Twitch um, from uh, Dishwasher Love, which is a great username. Um, there was a distinct lack of ribbon on it. Yes, um, correct. Uh, we, yeah, we'll be looking for the uh, the pre precursors to uh, when the when the ribbon and the company phase even exists. Yes, uh, let's see if I can't find this. Uh, the John Company files are really insanely organized uh, and the reason why they are cra crazily organized is because um, I was building them at the same time that I was moving and at the same time that I was finishing uh, my dissertation and it was a busy exhausting time and oh no where is it it was a busy, scary time to be me, and the files are just like a... Normally, I'm very organized when it comes to my, my files, and this was just the worst. <laughs> this was just like a complete disaster. Um, I can't find it. I'll find it at some point. Um, I, I do feel that everyone who has very organized files at one point in time had horrendous files. So th this, this is, is yeah, completely, completely true. I wonder... Okay, I'm going to look in one more place because I'm not, I'm not quite giving up. Uh, ooh, maybe. Yeah, I bet it's in here. Um, all right, we're gonna, okay, I have no idea what is gonna open. <laughs> um, I didn't realize it was gonna pop up on the screen. So, hello everyone, this is Photoshop. This is the new Photoshop <laughs> tour. Wow, you're really uh, fly, flying on the, uh, on the cuff right there with, yeah. uh, here we go, yes! Yes, I hit the jackpot. I hit the Photoshop jackpot. Oh, yes, um, okay, cool. So, um, briefly, in the search for John Company's look, uh, at one point, I my, my wife is a lovely artist, and uh, she was like, she I, I was talking to her about, it, and I was like, I wonder if these would look good, like like watercolors, like an educational game. So like this would be printed at about this size little bit lower and so this was a test painting that she did and I have like five or six of them uh, like she did sketches and inks and then you know you have these so we, we almost had um, a, a sort of like Katie Cole Whirly double bill here um, but yeah it didn't that's happen really a whole that's a whole family affair it was a whole well I didn't it was just one of those things where uh, like oh this is uh I should let you know that this is probably the time where Cole's uh oh it's happening is going to blip out for about for about 10 seconds Okay. Uh, hey. So, hey. Cool. And uh, you know, you know what's amazing? Um, my the the Twitch did not break. Oh. So okay. hi everyone, okay. I'm back. It's I will say this again. End. I live in a weird old house, and my internet sometimes just uh, okay. just does that, and you just have to deal. And I'm sorry. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah you, we're all back online. So okay. Cool. Yeah. So anyway, there's that lovely that roguish roguish gentleman. Um, so at, at this time, I I was getting better at Illustrator, and I was like, what if I did like abstract pictures <laughs> like me is this how john company needs to look i don't know um so here in, in this version we have um office cards which have the various actions and then they have uh, the, the notion of action and privilege this by the way has become like kind of a hallmark of how i do design work where i really like think in keywords and i'm like okay i need a word like action to exist and now I need a word like privilege to exist, and they have these different these different senses. So we have uh, these things right here, and then all of the uh, pieces that were like that w would become board elements. Like this is the factory box over here. Here the shipyard box. Those are like just cards floating around. Because remember, I'm still trying to fit it in like a little box like this. 
This is my, my hope and dream at this point. Yeah. Uh, I rather like this this illustration of the court of directors, these blokes kind of sitting there. Uh, and then for the prizes, I made little statue versions. <laughs> Here, let me let me rotate this so you can... Oh, we got to go around the horn. Um, there we go. Uh, so you can get a sense of how the how, the logic of the prizes. Now, for those who have played John Company, this is very similar to yeah. the final layout of the prize cards, mm -hmm. and those arrows it, date to a world where it was like little statues. <laughs> that it you were gives building. the se it gives the senior and executive position a different kind of flair. Yeah, different flair. I mean, I kind of like this look a lot, actually. Um, yeah, so you, we have those, and here are the old event cards. Uh, yeah, there's, I don't know why we had priority cards, uh, but yeah, and then here's like here are the the deregulated firms, right? So a lot a lot of the bones are are here even now. Um, okay, so now uh, let me see. I've created a big mess. Um, let me get to where I need to go. Excellent. Okay, so by the end of that summer, early oh boy, it's already eight twenty six. My goodness. Uh, by the beginning of that summer. Uh, so the end of the summer and early fall, the game was working. Um, I remember I, I, I used to play at this place called the Emerald Tavern, which was a like game cafe on the north side of Austin. Uh, so shout out to any Austin peeps in chat. I used to love to play there, um, even though their sandwiches were a little pricey. And uh, by the time we got through it, I had uh, what I call Kit 4.0. I don't know. My, my versioning didn't make any sense here. Oh. And um, in this kit, uh, it really, I decided to go with a period piece of kind of period style uh, illustration, but this is a very similar layout to what was used in the final oh, game. Yeah. So like this prize layout, more or less what the prize layout was. This office layout, pretty much there. Now, there weren't region cards yet. There were these region uh, placards, these like big square cards, um, which I had, but they, they worked kind of the same way. Uh, and, and actually, the reason why they were so big is you would put ships on the little nodes that were kind of set through them. Um, now, let's see here. So we go through these, and then, then we had, of course, all of these office cards. I wish I just want to rotate counterclockwise. There we go. Thank you. Um, so we have these office cards. Now, I showed this to Phil, and here are the... I mean, th th this design is actually quite similar to the design that you just saw to, to this kit. Um, it just looks nicer. Um, now I showed this to Phil and he printed it and played it and liked it quite a bit. And, uh, I sold it to him. Um, and I'll, I'll say that the, the rate that I sold it to him was 10% of wholesale, which is a very good rate for a designer, but he knew that I was going to coordinate the editing and I would also do the graphic design. So it was, it was a pretty even, even thing. And, you know, they say there's not very much money in game design, which is generally true, but, at this point, I was a very, very broke grad student, and so even a few thousand dollars could make the absolute world of difference. Um, and, you know, the, this game uh, helped me move to uh, Minnesota and join Leader. I would not have been able to design Root if I hadn't have built John Company first. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, it more or less paid for my move. Uh, okay, so here's the, here's the game then. Now, uh, an interesting thing happened in the game's development. Which, and I think, uh, Drew, you're directly, this is where you really enter the scene. Um, there was a problem with this game. And the problem was players didn't know what the hell was happening when they were playing it. Because the organization of the company was spread across all these offices. And those office cards were very far away on the table. You could, like, barely see them. And you might say, like, wait, whose turn is it? Is? Oh, no, it, it's off, we're on Office 5. Well, Office 5 says I need to ask something for Office 6. And it's like, oh, well, who's that? And uh, the game was very hard to hold in your head. And, Drew, I think you had a play test in Chicago uh, where you and maybe you and Chai uh, and Chaz, Chaz played it yeah. and some other folks. Mm -hmm. And and maybe Matt, Matthew Root was there, too. And the comment was... Uh, we absolutely, absolutely need a board. Now, I had put the kibosh on any board talk. Because remember, I'm trying to get into a box like this big. There's no board. No board's going in here. Um, and and so it, it just became evident that I needed it. And I still have the email where I said, hey, Phil, I think we might need to do a board. I'm going to go explore it. And so I will now show you all um, the board. 
So here we have, this is my very, very first attempt at a John Company board. Incredible. I, I, I made this very I, quickly. I, for, I, forgot, I, I forgot about this, uh, this, di uh, this diagnostic. Oh, it's the ribbon. Yeah. It's here. Yeah, <laughs> um, it so the, um, th th this is actually the size of a card. And what I did, again, I'm just starting to learn Illustrator. And I was like, okay, how does the board even like look? And I, I was working at a writing lab at the University of Texas where I had to like proctor. And if, if for those who don't know what that means, basically I was like the tech support guy for like a dozen teachers who were running, you know, digital classrooms and they never needed me. So I would just sit there and read the New Yorker or whatever. And th today though, I had a bunch of magic markers and illustrator and I was like, how do you organize this board so that you can show the op or operation order of the company? And then secondly, the promotion order. So here you have the company phase in this red ribbon. And then here, you ha in blue, you have the shares choosing this office. You have this office choosing these offices. You have this office choosing these offices. So all this stuff is like, you know, kind of sitting in there. Um, yeah, this it, it does look a little bit like MS Visio. Um, so, okay, so I, I did this, and after I designed it... Uh, by the way, there's all sorts of weird stuff happening here. Like, why is this jogging to the right? I, did, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, like, this could have just been a straight line. <laughs> so I sat on this for a while, and Drew, I showed it to Drew, and Drew was like, yeah, I think this would make the game easier to play. And so I decided to make, like, a real test of it. And here we have it as a real uh, test. Now, now you see the guts of the company. One second. I need to close some of these images because I have like a million things open. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. Now you can see like, hey, wow, this is, I'm preserving this jog. Why? I don't know. I, <laughs> it's, it's so weird um, looking at your old work. Uh, okay. So here it was. I was like, and after I played this, I was like, okay, I'm sad the illustrations are on the board, but I really want to keep them if we can. And let's see if this works. And I sat down and played it, and instantly, it was better. Like mm -hmm. instantly, it was like oh. I, I I remember that it was it was a matter of minutes that like, even the even skeptical to the point that like printing out and assembling it, but once you we got through that family the, the like the first couple uh, mm -hmm. positions through the company phase it. Uh, it felt so right. And then uh, I, I wrote Phil an email and said, hey, Phil, can we make this a big box? And he said, yes, but you have to keep it under a kilogram. And I said, that's easy. That No one's going to have trouble keeping it under a kilogram. So uh, this, um, what I think of is this, uh, this board inaugurated the second phase of John Company's development, which lasted through the, the spring of 2017. Is, is that right? Yes. The spring of 2017. Um, and ended with uh, myself and my good friend Chaz, who was also serving as the game's developer, uh, packing our we had I was packing my, the, the apartment, uh, and we were playing a game of Antiquity that we had set up on one table, and a game of John Company we had set up on another in the evenings. And I was working on my dissertation, and we were getting ready to move across the country. And it finished, and basically what we had at the end was something like this, which uh, is a board that some of you will be familiar with. Uh, an, an exceptionally busy board, but every little pit, bit matters. Um, I think this is the final board, or it, it's quite close. It's quite close to the final board. Uh, and then in terms of where the actual um, game ended, because the board was expensive, we dropped the regional placards for these um, region cards, which I will uh, rotate here. Um, so here we have these region cards. So you can see like this element right here, this little design that was a very big part of here of the pla of the placards right? yeah this and was going to be a big central ordered. i was going to have all sorts i was going to have a different um i can't remember the name of that technique um i was going to have a different a different pattern on each one there was all this research i was doing and then it ended up being just a little stripe and so i thought well a color is fine <laughs> a color will do me just fine um these region colors, by the way, were picked by uh, a fellow named Karim, who is a wonderful graphic designer who does a lot of Phil's work. I asked him for a set of eight colors and gave him some art pieces, and he he uh, built those together. Uh, okay, so uh, we've got you know the reverse side. This is you know pretty much what John Company was as published. We've got these uh, the bases and all this stuff, prize cards. I always like the back of the prize cards. 
Nothing, nothing as classy as like a low contrast black and white with nice big white text. It's like you're selling wine or something. Yeah, um, and already I'm like trying to stuff art in like every corner because so much art was lost, right? And so like I wanted to put these little art pieces like back behind them because when you look at the board, I mean, it's just, it's, it's nice, but like it has no art. There's like no art punch to this mm-hmm. board, except you've got this image, which is mostly just black <laughs> for, for the parliament, for the parliament thing. Um, okay. And that was, that was John company y'all. That was the, that was the production of the game. Now I have already used more than half my time. And we haven't started talking about the second edition. So I'm going to speed <laughs> up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Are there any questions I'll, I need I'll to get through. to drew before I jump in? Um, you know what? I think in, in the better case of time, let's uh, power through and then we'll okay, uh, get cool. to Cool. Then we'll do questions. And we, look, if we go over, I don't care. So, you know, if, if we, we go through all this stuff and then we can have a little chat afterwards. I don't mind staying an extra half an hour or something. Sure. Um, okay. So, I titled the seminar Building a Better John Company and I meant to do it. Um, John Company uh, is a game that I cared a lot about. I care a lot about. But it was also a little imperfect. It didn't. It didn't get finished the way I wanted it to get finished because I didn't have the abil- I didn't have the stability to produce it properly. Um, when I think about the care that I've been able to give Oath or that I was able to give Root or certainly the second edition of Premier, um, there was never a rush. I knew where all the pieces went. I knew if I had a design liability that we could direct time towards it, and. John Company, you know, I had really intended it to be like a lighter Republic of Rome, and it turned into something kind of as ponderous, and there were lots of bits that just like didn't quite have like the elegance they needed. It wasn't inviting to play. I think about this a lot, um, because I th- there's something when you look at a game on your shelf and you think, oh, I really want to play that right now, and every component in that box is a is a barrier to play even the cool pieces right if i if i look at like a big a big fancy euro a game i might really like and think oh i kind of want to play it tonight but i when i open it up if i'm just flooded by like little pieces i might think well like maybe not maybe not tonight tonight maybe like next week uh and that's the next week that never comes uh and so i really wanted this game to be approachable i wanted to be the kind of game that you'd be like no let's play john uh, let's get john company out there we played you know we played puerto rico last week it's been a while Let's get John Company down there. And so the game had to be, it had to have a kind of like accessibility that was gripping and but but didn't compromise the scope of the game. And so there were all these, there's all these little fiddly bits in John Company. Like the refresh phase takes too long. Uh, it's a little hard to know what to do. So hard that you spend enough time worrying about what you can do that you don't have a lot of time to like scheme or negotiate. And so going into the second edition, one of the biggest priorities was look at where the heart of the negotiations are and build that space. I want to give players, this is a negotiation game. I want players to have every single tool and to use those tools in really creative ways to make all kinds of wild negotiations. And so there, what I really wanted to was to just give the game like a really hard development pass where we went through, we balanced it. And then in addition to that, um, you know, I, I kind of, the one way, and I, I've told this to people who have demoed the game uh, over the, you know, over Discord and things, uh, one of the, uh, over, over the con, sorry, uh, one of the things that I was hoping to do is I had kind of three goals to the development. Firstly, I wanted to fix the game. There, there were some exploits and some problems where the game kind of shortchanged itself. I wanted to fix those. That was like goal one. Tighten the design, fix, uh, balance the scenarios, give it a little more punch. Right. That's all goal one. Goal two is that I wanted the physical presentation of the game to help players, to not be a hindrance, and to really update the UI uh, and I've learned a lot about game UI over the past three years, and I wanted to put those lessons towards John Company. And then the third goal is that I wanted to emphasize, not emphasize, I wanted to elaborate and it kind of unfold some of the game's storytelling. And this was really a goal that emerged as I started working on Oath. Because one of the things about Oath is Oath is a PAX game that tries to ground itself. And so a lot of PAX games have abstractions, which is fine. 
Um, but I mean, I even and even though I think Pamir is a plenty, um, uh, is certainly a narratively driven game. I do recognize, uh, I do understand when people say, "Hey, uh, Pamir sometimes doesn't feel like the great game, or doesn't feel like Central Asia at this period," and 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 that makes sense because there are many layers of abstraction. And one of the goals of Oath as a design was to say, hey, what does the PAX world look like if we get rid of those abstractions, if we ground the players? And so that's why like, you have a pawn in Oath. And so if you want to go to some land and like, r recruit someone, you actually have to move your piece and do it. So in, in that way, it's a little bit like a Lord's game. Oath is, it's so funny, Oath is like, uh, sorry, this, my, my one, I get one a day, my one aside about Oath. Um, sure. a lot of folks are going into Oath hoping that it's an accessible PAX game and I'm sorry <laughs> what it is though is it's an accessible Lords game and when you reframe it that way I think Oath makes a ton more sense as it is um, and it also like it allows Oath to be more of what Oath is um, mm -hmm. And some people will say, and, and I, because I think that, like, on the one hand, the PAX games are kind of the first pass at doing an accessible Oath game, or an accessible Lords game. I, I'm speaking in riddles right now for folks who don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The PAX games were based on an older set of games called the Lords games. Uh, Lords of the Sierra Madre being the first Lords one, the Lords of the Renaissance, Lords of the, of the Spanish Main. And um, the Lords games are awesome. They're huge. They're gigantic games, and they they barely hold together, but they're brilliant. And I I think my feeling about the Pax games is that they were a good first attempt at boiling down that chaotic majesty, but Oath to me is my second attempt, and it's a completely different framework. Okay. Anyway, that I'm I'm having a lot of little fireworks there's, going off in my mind. There, there's your uh, there's your oath oath aside, but I think that that's a really important like gra like a. Uh, foundation for like approaching the uh I can the redevelopment in terms of uh, uh thinking about our um uh like our methodology and our ethos going into what we want out of a second edition also for those that are in uh the discord with us uh, i'm gonna go ahead and mute him i got him <laughs> okay just double check. all right sorry john if you have any questions feel free to let me know and i'll uh, i will unmute you um I, just, I didn't want you to get picked up um okay yeah so anyway i just i had a little like firing in my mind about that and i want to write about it but i'll do that later not on a stream um okay so that was the goal of john comedy sex edition right away was let's make the design better let's make it easier to play and more usable and let's really dig into the storytelling. I want players playing this game to feel like they're in David Copperfield or Vanity Fair. I want them to feel like creatures of the Victorian novel who are existing on a global stage. Um, someone asked me uh, once, like, who do you play in John Company? And I always want to tell them, like, you're the matriarch or the patriarch of a British family. Like... So if you ever want, wonder, like, where are the women in John Company? It's like, you are. You are playing, like, the social overlords who are guiding the, these, various, these various actions, right? Uh, you know, so think about Mansfield Park or something. Okay, anyway, I'll stop talking about Victorian Lit because I could go wild or Regency Lit. Um, all right, so anyway, let's talk about that. So that was my original idea. And the very first attempt at that was this. This is the Alpha Kit for John Company, second edition. Um, and the, the premise behind the Alpha Kit was, hey, what if we brought cards back? <laughs> that was really as simple as it was. Originally, Drew and I thought like, oh, let, let's do an easy second edition. It'll be low key, we'll have an upgrade pack, it'll be fine. Um, and we, we tried it, and the very beginning, the idea was, you know, put the office and all of the little details about how the office works on here, because in the old game, Sorry. In the old game, we boiled the actions to these icons, which were not super helpful because you wanted to know how the action worked. And this icon doesn't really tell you anything. I'll zoom in here so you can see what I'm talking about. Like, this icon doesn't tell you anything. Uh, so in the new John Company, we were like, hey, what if we had, like, the cards were more like player aids? And then on the back of the cards, we could have who fills it. So we don't really need like a ribbon. Or if we have a ribbon, it can be a lower in the visual hierarchy element and because we can have that information on the back of the cards. So yeah, here's the, here's the, the, the first attempt here. Um, and we're going to keep everything more or less uh, 
together. Mm-hmm. What one thing I did want to change right away was how factories and shipyards worked. So I had like supplemental cards for them because I really wanted players to be able to trade factories and shipyards, which you can't do in the first edition. Um, okay, so that was the the kind of a initial pass. Um, and then we kept working on that all winter. So this is like, you know, in, in the months leading up to the Kickstarter. And we eventually, um, we, we event, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Um, so we eventually uh, came up, I was originally going to preserve the old event system because I like it and it's proven. Um, but we just kept finding that it was a roadblock. What would happen is players would finally get the wind beneath their sail and start feeling like, very good about how the game was working and then they'd hit the event stage and it would hit them like a brick a wall a wall of bricks because they were like oh there are all these rules i don't understand what's a sovereign nation and the, the the momentum of the game would go to a crawl so we went through a bunch of event systems my favorite one of the ones that we threw away was this one which uh drew you were the the originator of and the, oh, ba- yeah. the way it worked is it still preserved the elephant who traveled around India. And whenever the elephant traveled to a region, you would flip an event card and you would ask yourself, is this region depressed or prosperous? And if it's prosperous, you do this thing. And if it's depressed, you do this thing. And then you go to the next event. And now it's like, hey, is, is India in chaos or order? If it's in order, this happens. If it's in chaos, this happens. Um, and I like this system, but one of the problems that we found was that it was still a lot of rules and it wasn't like doing very much work. Like it, all of the events in India stuff was like two or three degrees away from what the players were having to worry about. And while that's a cute thing to say, if you're trying to make an argument about the game from a design standpoint, I was wasting rules. And one of the things I think about a lot when I'm working on design is, um, I think about it like an, I, I try to be like, I try to pretend I'm an engineer evaluating a structure and you ask yourself, okay, I'm spending my weight budget. Is this rule is, which is worth maybe 30 or 50 or 60 or 100 or 200 words? Is this rule actually bearing any of the load of the game's drama? And if it's not, like get rid of it. So even though I, you know some of the games I work on are really big, I try not to make bloated designs. I really like do try to cut them as as cleanly as I can, um, and so like this event system all ultimately kind of had to you know get 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 tossed because it just wasn't it just wasn't generating heat. And so Drew and I were in this funny spot. We like met uh, in February before launching the Premier Kickstarter, and thought like maybe we should wait longer on John Company. And indeed, we worked all spring and summer on John Company while Pamir was at the factory in the second, uh, in, in the second run. Um, we, we were working on John Company, but this weird thing was happening, which is that we were going backwards. Like all of the, like, because originally we had such a surgical second edition, such a surgical second edition. We were just going to change just a few little things, and with just a few magic changes, everything was going to be easy. Uh, but the more we worked on it, the more we realized that the notion of having an update kit, a $10, $15, $20 little update kit that would bring everybody up to the second edition, it, uh, it wasn't a productive creative constraint. Sometimes the, uh, a, a constraint that forces you to work in a certain um, footprint is so, so, so productive. And other times it's a straitjacket and it, is, it stifles creativity. So I... You're coming from very much from a place where you know you know that straitjacket O oh, too well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like I think of I mean, it's so I, I can't wait for folks to get their copies of Oath. Sorry, I'm break, I'm going to steal from tomorrow's Oath mention because we thought so much about like volume and working on that game and like how much could we put in the box. And Premier's this the same way. Like uh, it, it's so funny. I remember when I, I showed Joe the insert design we had designed for Premier. Because I told him we had wanted to design a, a special plastic insert for Premiere. And he was like, oh, cool, I'm really excited. I love custom inserts. And I'm like, yeah, we're working really hard on it. And then I showed it to him, and he was like, this is so dumb and boring. He didn't say it quite like that. Uh, Joe is my, our, our product manager at Panda. But he was like, this doesn't seem special. And I was like, man, a lot of work went into figuring out exactly how to get this game to fit in this shape. And what you find is that at the factory level, 
everyone's going to want to default to a larger box because it just means it's easier to design an insert. They're like, there are lots of ways, you know, if you have a giant box, you can design an insert millions of ways. But if you have a small box that's only the exact right size, then there is one way to design the insert. And that's it. And so from, you know, that puts more pressure on, on us and on their engineers. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I really wanted the game to fit. I, I like designing for a particular footprint. Um, but, you know, and I have a you know, little show and tell again. You know, here is the, the Premier box. And it's very important to me that John Company fit in a box this size or like maybe a little bit deeper, potentially. Mm -hmm. And that that is a very productive constraint. And so basically we over the summer, Drew and I shifted our frame of reference from instead of, hey, what's the cutest and fastest way to build a, a high impact, low overhead second edition to what does this game actually want to look like? Like what what does now that we have some resources to make this game look any way we want it, like what should it even look like? And that changed how we approached development. Now, here I'm going to take you guys right into um, into the heart of how I work. <laughs> um, and we're, we're, we're going into Illustrator for a little fun. Um, so, I started getting wild. Now, I do a lot of my thinking in Illustrator. Oh. So, I make things like this. And I'm moving these pieces around and whatever. And what I started thinking about is like, what if you had a modular board? That, like, it could shrink and it could grow depending on the shape of the company. And then I was, yeah, like, oh, what if you had this, like, maybe like an old school Victorian game with a snaky, a snaky track. Mm -hmm. Maybe this should be how it works. And then maybe that snaky track, like, you want players to be able to rearrange it. So maybe the elements should be hexes because then they can build different styles of, of, of company. And then like, oh yeah, let's just mock that up. Here's some senior jobs, or ships purchasing, here's its treasury. Maybe the treasury should look like this. You know, if there's a law that's passed, maybe it changes the arrangement of the company in some interesting way. Um, now this is not a good idea, but this is a place where I like to work and I can make, you know, I like, I like working in Illustrator and I've gotten better at it. Um, so I'm like fooling around in this platform. Uh, and then out of that came, show you here, uh, the first attempt at the board. Here it is. There's my very bad India. I just very quickly drew. Um, and the notion here was, what if we, what if it were just a line though? <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, all that, like all that modularity, that's cute. But one one of the problems I had with it what was look. I mean, I had done Premier. I'd been thinking about how Premier had been received, mm -hmm. and I was like, this can't look like uh, Ti. I just saw in the in the chat. It can't look like Ti. That's that's not allowed. What if, what about a line? Line's a good shape, right? Or you know, I guess it's a shape. I don't know. Um, just a long line. And Drew, I remember when you were here, Drew. We we were yeah. we did all of this in a single day where we were like working and working and working. And then at the very end of the day, I was like, okay, what about this? And I just started laying this out and this was laid out in like half an hour. Just very like simple, like, ugh. Um, so uh, Frisco says, well, why isn't it a good idea? It just wasn't a good idea because it just didn't match the project. It, it matched a different project. Um, so we, we light, light up this line. I'm like, yeah, you know, offices, maybe they've got ships and goods, maybe they have armies and riders. And then the presidencies, these are region cards. And so what I was figuring out here was like, oh yeah, you could fit, you could fit seven regions if you have like a presidency box. I like this idea. We have these big presidencies. And then we'll put a map of India. And I was like, oh, as soon as I, as soon as I said that aloud, I remember being like, John Company needs a map of India. It needs a map of India. What an important thing. And so uh, Drew went back to Chicago, and after I was done crying about it, um, I started working on a redraw, and it looked like this. Here's John Company's second edition, the first workable version from early this summer, early this past summer. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you can see these pale lines. Here, let's see if I can make them bigger. Oh, wow, that's, why is, uh, someone's been... 
messing with my illustrator. Um, come on, one second, sorry. Um, so I don't even see this. I, I always build with uh, prototype production in mind. So I have three artboards. Oh, I just, well, don't worry, don't, don't listen to me. I have an artboard here and here and here and they're each one uh, US letter sized. So the idea was, this board's easy, just bam, 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 three panels, you fold it like a, like a Z, easy, beautiful. Um, and here's the map of India, which is so nice, and there's, there's the board and all that stuff. And then here were all the order cards and things like that. And here's the family cards. And so the reason why I'm laying this all out in Illustrator is mostly because like I'm thinking about it in Illustrator uh, and then also it's easy for me to print. I know that this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight page kit. And that's like an easy thing for me to print. I also do a lot of this mumbo jumbo. I'll like write out design notes. I, this was some system I was thinking about. I don't know. It, it <laughs> and, meant... I, th I think that the file history provides such an interesting little like a journal cross section. of your You are like, now. you are seeing my brain in a really direct way. I'm very proud of this map of India, by the way, because I looked at this map and just kind of like drew it and or rather I drew it. And then I looked at this map after I was done and I was like, I have a pretty good job drawing a map of India <laughs> freehand. Um, okay. So yeah, that, that's, that's what that one looked like. Now, uh, what I want you to, to see here, is here is the next one. So uh, there's a few things that changed here. I'll actually I'll bring up the previous one so we can do a, a more direct comparison. Um, yeah, this is going to go a little over an hour, and I'm sorry, but I'm not really that sorry because I'm having fun. Okay, so here's here's uh, the first playable pass, and then after some more development, we go here. One of the things that happened is the regions got smaller, and then I could have a closed region dialogue. And then this uh, UI developed. Uh, we broke the prizes away from the prestige cards, which was very important. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, basically, well, actually, I'll talk about it now. Uh, what we found was in John Company, you deal out the prizes randomly, but some distributions are just much better than others. And a pretty even distribution is ideal. You want some cheap prizes, you want some expensive prizes. Um, so then, uh, but I, I also the really liked hmm? is, uh, the company standing is also uh, like the first introduction of that. On oh, the, yeah, this uh, is the first introduction of company standing. Yeah, which which, which replaces the old bailout system. Um, but for the prestige car, for the prize, car, for the prizes, I wanted there to still be cool, unique powers because it's a it's a good grounding place. It fits that third criteria for the redevelopment. And so I um, I had this prestige deck of like cool special powers that you could get and in fitting with the notion of making the game better uh, all the prestige cards are fully negotiable and I'll, I'll show you some of those pretty soon um, okay so then we've got branch four uh, branch four was followed by uh, branch five now one thing about this is you may notice the map of India is getting larger <laughs> with, with every with, with every design iteration over the summer um, we just made India bigger. And uh, this iteration, the big jump was we had these region cards, which are abstracting all of the um, all of the details about how the different regions in India worked. And uh, they just they don't feel like don't feel like a place you visit, right? And so once we put a map of India on the board, uh, this was Drew's suggestion. Drew Drew said like, "Hey, what about a big map of India?" And he said that, and I was like, oh, we can get rid of the region cards. What if we do a map of India, and then we drop the region cards, and then all of the orders go on India? So, like, this is an order that's worth seven and six if it's depressed. This one's worth ten, but then only three if it's depressed. The number of ships you need to fill it is the, the big number in the order. You have these sea zones where you can put the ships. You can put the ships on the sea zones, right? I mean, it was like all of these, like, very basic almost elementary design principles of like hey a boat you should put the boat on the water right i mean like very basic immersive steps that you can take um okay so that is five let me show you branch six um oh uh one other thing i'll say about five these arrows are like the movement of the elephant it would move around these uh, uh arrows that was how that was working um and then we went to here this one is a pretty similar um 
I'm already dropping things. I'm wondering, like, do you really need regions to be depressed? Do we need the elephant to work that way? Uh, and in fact, uh, you'll notice this little circle up here. Already we're starting to rethink how some of the event cards should work. And then we get to branch 7, which is the current branch of the game. Uh, which I'll show you now, and this is going to be like a magic trick. Maybe. Maybe it'll be like a magic trick. <laughs> it's in 3D now. Oh, it's like, there we go. It's well, like well, Dorothy and good. Oz. Um, okay, so here's where the game is right now. Um, the game right now uh, looks a lot like that seventh branch, and there were all sorts of little things that we have changed uh, in the road to making this game uh, what it is at the moment. Um, so let me talk you through just a few things that we've that we've been put in here. Um, so. Firstly, uh, we have we have adjusted the company order. It works a little bit differently, and it's built in such a way as to minimize interrupts and to just aid the flow of the game. So it's nice and smooth all the way through. Uh, it's very naturalistic ap approach in terms of like, you know, I always think about nat naturalistic design for me. Uh, it has like two criteria. One of them is it's. Um, it works the way it feels like it should work, and it works in a way that feels thematically coherent. Uh, and, and sometimes those are different things, but tr good natural design should be looking for moments where, where they're the same. Um, so, you know, you, you start by doing attrition, and then etc., and you kind of go through all these phases. Um, we have uh, shipyards right here, and factories and manors. One thing I'll say about shipyards is uh, they're linked to specific ships. This is the shipyard that builds the Atlas. The Atlas is a ship, a ship piece that will be screen printed with its name, uh, or, or probably more likely with just a, a capital letter that will correspond to its name. All of the names um, are, uh, are period ships that worked. Now, um, one thing I'll say about the, this board, uh, someone mentioned, oh, the delightful clutter, and yes, the delightful clutter. Uh, what we tried to do is make a board where we chose the clutter very strategically. So this board has probably a 20th of the amount of text as the old first edition board. I'll, uh, you know what, I'll bring that up. I can prove it. Um, so here again is the old board at, uh, well, well, there we go. Here's the old board, lots of text. And the new board uses that text space for images. Uh, probably these washed out images of uh, British caricatures, which we'll use as the kind of like guiding motif as if this were something printed in a, in a periodical. Um, so here, here's the shipyard, the Atlas. Um, then we have factories. Factories no longer have goods pieces. Instead, uh, factories are hedges against the company. So when the company does really bad, factories are more profitable. And when the company does super well, factories are not profitable. Uh, so they're very clearly a hedge against against the company. And then, of course, uh, the beloved manners. Now, you'll note on the manor that it costs five pounds and it's worth two victory points, which is the exact same thing it's always been worth. So, so much of this game's cash economy is very similar to the way it used to be. Um, then you have these prestige cards, and I'm going to take you through just a few of them that I really like. Uh, I'll do a search. Whoops. Um, so, uh, you know... One of the things I like about the prestige cards is it's allowed me to uh, make use of these Thomas Rawlinson uh, political cartoons, or just cartoons, I guess. And here's the, the publishing house, uh, which this is a card that you might win when you, when you score, score your prize. You'll see the more expensive prizes give you amounts of prestige cards here. And so you might gain a publishing house. This house is tradable. You can sell it to somebody if you'd like. And uh, critically, all prestige cards have a value, a prestige value in the top left. Now, that prestige value is very important because the person with who has the most prestigious holdings in their private hand and publicly at the end of the game uh, doesn't lose victory points for outstanding promises. Uh, this is very important. So, you know, uh, if, if you're in a spot where... Uh, you are extremely prestigious. No one cares uh, if you hold hold your promises. Um, okay, so do, 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 yeah, the uh, 
Man, I should put an over den. That's a great. That's a great it's suggestion. A, it's a fantastic suggestion, it's a, especially yeah, because I mean, Drew knows how much I love over den. Um, yeah. And also, all the um, again, like I can't emphasize how like this is so clearly a weird digital TTS prototype with the uh, the copy and pasted um, uh, 3D assets like the Scrabble pieces. Oh yeah, no, no, this game's gonna be mad beautiful, y'all. I, I can't even tell you, uh, it's gonna be so beautiful. We we um, we're currently selecting the artist that's gonna do the sculpts of the map stuff, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, one thing I like about these cards too, the South Seas Company. Um, I can have the t I have the text space to write a power that is a lot more interesting and interactive than those like tiny little text boxes on the other ones. Um, also, the marriages are back, the back, they never left. Uh, and I love this. When you mar when you marry someone, uh, give this card to a consenting player and place one of your family members on this card. Uh, you and your partner must now give hiring priority to the other. This cannot be traded. Uh, but don't worry. If you get too, uh, too upset, you can always find a bishop who will help you with the divorce. Um, all right. So... Yeah. Uh, bum, 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 bum. uh yeah, got got gotta get gotta get divorced in the mix. Anyway, th those are the I could talk about the prize cards for a long time. They're the, the prize cards are not done. They're like they, they need a lot of development work, but they're moving along. Um, okay. So what I want to do now is talk about well here, let me talk about the offices. So here we have the office cards. Look, all that art is back. Um, these are bridge size cards. Yeah, I, I might have uh, pilfered some 3D models from other TTS mods. This is a private use mod. I will have a nice mod for testing eventually with with things that I'll commission and purchase uh, more properly. Yeah, so, um, okay. So here we have the offices, big art pieces from people who held offices or historical uh, equivalents at, at the time. And this gives me room to say, hey, the director of trade, what, what is this power? They can transfer writers and ships from one presidency to another. They assign captains. And then if this poor sap decides to retire or is forced to retire, you flip the card over in the vacant offices row. And then during the hiring phase, you just go through the vacant offices. Um, which is one of the things I really like. That That's part of that, like, making... <laughs> yeah, you're right, the chair art is surviving. I mean, stuff from, like, you know, 2014, like the real early, 2016. Okay. Um, it, yeah, it is amazing that we're, that we're saving the, uh, the, uh, uh, the overhead of the hiring ribbon and instead not just replacing it with the text for the hiring priority on the back of the card, but also talking about eligible candidates, which the even the uh, like even the, the, even the, the ribbon didn't do. Design, yeah, couldn't do. Yeah, so like for example, the president of Madras here, he, he is filled by the director of trade, and anybody in in the presidency, writers' offices and provincial office, writers' officers and provincial offices is eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get to have a, kind of all the different parts right there. Um, and then I also uh, learned a lot about chart design. And so like this is probably what the charts are going to look like, which is like, hey, you're trading. What What is that? Well, every die, every dollar you spend is going to give you a die. So you get a, a die for every dollar. I guess I should probably reverse these. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. Because, you know, the way way you speak. And then uh, you, you lose a die for every every trade contract you you have, which I'll talk about later. And then the special bonuses, presidents gain a dollar for every completed order there. Um, okay. So those are the president cards. Uh, the weird setup, so this is about that, like, accessibility thing of, like, how easy is it to just take John Company off the shelf and play it? Well, one of the barriers to John Company I found was that players always forget the setup rules, and I don't blame them because the setup rules are complicated. So now we just have 12 setup cards, and you just deal three to every player, and it creates a randomized and workable game state. And we'll probably have, we might have a set of these for every player count. Not, not for every player count, for every scenario. Or or we'll just have optional cards that, 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 sure. that you'll, you'll put in for the different scenarios. I'm not sure which way is the right way to do that. Uh, but yeah, th those are the setup cards. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Yep. Uh, okay. Um... 
it is amazing uh, having had seen the first edition board and all the other iterations and truly how much more art and less text is on it. But the addition of the roll cards and the large family boards, you're like, it is almost uh, like working towards this like tableau of actions in front of players. Yeah, you'll have like all your holdings will be like in front of you. Yeah, and like, you know, your assets that are freely tradable as well. Okay, so what I want to do now, I know I'm like already over time, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, what I want to do now is quickly talk through the order of the turn, just so you can kind of see how it works. So like attrition, for instance, we have a new attrition system, um, and some people are going to love this. They're just going to love it, because I'm. It, it, it's a lot like the John Company low luck system. Um Oh, will, will the ships be lettered tiles instead of three pieces? The ships will probably be a flat silhouette of a ship with a screen print for the ship ID printed on it. We're not totally sure yet. We've already got cool 3D pieces planned, and the, the what's important about the ships is that players sometimes need to put their pieces on them, so they need to look a little different. So we're not we're not super sure on ships yet, but that's. Uh, that's something that we're figuring out this month. So, okay, the way attrition works is you roll a die. And you roll a die for every office that you have. And on a one or a two, nothing happens. On a three or a four, the office generates a fatigue. And on a five or a six, he retires. And he re when, when he retires, the family member who was on that spot becomes a pensioner. And you flip the thing over and you put it there. Now, every fatigue that is sitting on an office is going to add plus one to the roll. So this roll would be six plus one is seven. So like he'd also re re retire if that was the roll. Um, and, and that's it. That's all attrition is. You don't need to worry about different values or all that other stuff. Um, yeah, I, I did pr present this in the forums as an al alternative. And th there are reasons why it... It, I'm, it's not a to, I'm not beating a total re re retreat for my initial proposal, but this version does work a little bit better. It's also nice because your, your people get more character, right? Like, this guy is ship's purchasing could have gotten very stressed out while being in ship's purchasing, and that means if he's ever promoted to, like, a presidency, he might not last very long. Um, so that that's about that, like, good naturalistic thing. Um, so... Uh, uh, in terms of that rule, probably not. So one of the things that I'm trying to avoid, that, that kind of rule uh, stuff will be on the rules reference sheet, which if you know Pamir, Pamir is a single sheet reference that contains like 90% of all the rules in the game. Because this dice rolling system, the like, oh, uh, printed on the board or, or, or card, it'll be on like a single sheet of card stock, like a paper. Um, and the reason why it would it would be there is because this idea of like one or two nothing like one or two hooray he's alive three or four take a fatigue five or six they're dead that fatigue system is used a bunch of places in in the design so you, you don't need it to like put it everywhere and that was a, that was really a lot of the sin of the first edition I gave people reminders for things that they could learn pretty easily and the um, one small side one thing I always think about is uh, the game Container, which is an amazing game that everyone should be playing. Uh, I used to, when I taught Container, give people little player references, but I found that it actually made teaching the game harder because players wouldn't remember what I was telling them. Like, Container only has four actions. You shouldn't need a player reference. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, have one but be able to put it in the box. And so I, I, I try to, like, pick and choose where we're going to put references. Um uh, yeah, and, and, and there there will be a chart, like this is the rule book of the first one, you can see um, all, you know, charts with the various numbers for different checks that you make and things like that. Um, yeah. uh, oh, this is a good time for me to ask, uh, just because you're talking about influences of the game, someone uh, in uh, in the Discord asked uh, if there was a, um, if you could tell if there was any direct influences to uh, an 18xx game. And I know that there is certainly a design, a part of the design, which we haven't even uh, talked about for the second edition. Um, or the first um, uh, that I can think of that is certainly influenced by uh, 18xx. Ooh, which part are you thinking, Drew? I'm thinking about the uh, the the specifically the shareholding. Uh, yeah, 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 and and that the way dividends work. Mm -hmm. the, there is a lot of weird like 18xx blood, XX blood in this game, 
but it's it's peculiar right like the way shareholding and debt works is like not dissimilar from the way some of them work but less 1830 and more like 1817 or 1841 and like so some of the otter ducks um Okay, so, uh, and then we have family phase where players take family actions. The way the family phase works is a little different. It's very streamlined. You're going to have a number of children, and then during your family phase, you just send those children places. And then once you're out of children, you're done, and you also get to retire your pensioner. Like the old game, if you, were, if you have a pensioner, you got one chance to retire him. If you don't find a good home for this guy, he's, he's kicking the bucket. Yeah, it's a bummer that container is expensive and that the version that is so small and portable and nice is even more expensive. Um, Drew's got one on a shelf behind him. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, debt auction. Okay, so one one other difference. I'm, I'm getting in the weeds here. i got to move faster. Uh, one big difference from this game, in the first edition, players could buy as many shares as they wanted. They could just buy, like, eight shares. And that doesn't work like that anymore. Now, whenever you buy a share, it's basically the way it works is we auction the company's debt. And when the debt is removed, a share is is, uh, is created. Um, so there will be more turnover than the first edition, question mark. Not that much more. There is a little bit more turnover. Um, that That is true, but there's also less offices. So you get a little more churn. Um, the, first, the the second edition has a little bit more a little faster turnover in the offices it also has a little bit more cash both inputting and outputting so it feels a little more dramatic more stuff happens in the second edition um, okay so then we do hiring I already talked about hiring and then we go to the chairman so the offices work pretty much like they used to right so like the chairman is has the power of the purse the first thing that they do is they allocate they send money to the different offices um, and then for ships purchasing, like ships purchasing is going to buy ships. Uh, and then where they start to change is like military affairs and the director of trade. Uh, one of their biggest jobs is they get to do transfers. So now the military affairs, let's say we've got like, I don't know, here's a, some officers in training. Military affairs, the first thing they're going to do is they get to make officer transfers. So they could like transfer these officers up to Bombay and then they can send their officers in training wherever. This creates a little bit of movement, and the old rules about only three officers per army and all that stuff are gone. But you also don't have guns. You just have officers, um, which, which work much, much the same way. Um, the director of trade can move ships around, and this is huge because at the beginning of the game, you're going to have a ship in every zone, and the director of trade has two ship transfers, so they could be like, yeah, we're going to do this. Which, the, the Director of Trade was always like a bummer for me, because historically it was a very cool position, but in John Company 1 it like wasn't that interesting. They're way more powerful in the, in the second edition. Mm -hmm. Now, the presidencies work pretty much the way they used to work, uh, with a couple cool exceptions. So the way trading works is every order, the number on the order is the bandwidth, how many ships do you need to fill that order? So we have one here, one here, two ships up here in Maratha. And then what the orders are worth depends on the leftmost uncovered value on every region's chaos track. So, uh, you know, let's say the Bombay presidency rolls to trade and they don't own any trade contracts right now, so they'll spend all five of their dollars. Bloop. They'll roll five dice. They'll successfully trade because you only use the low roll, just like the old edition. And now they can fill orders. So when they fill orders, they fill orders by putting riders on the orders to mark that they're completed. And then in every region that they traded, they gain a trade contract, which means future trades will have a penalty. And then for that, they gain $5, $10, plus 9 is $19. And we advance this like this. Now, players who've played a lot of John Company um, know that the company income track is like the most important part of the dang game. And it always kind of bummed me out that the income track was centrally located in the board of the, fir of the first edition. But it was pretty small. You were just moving a little cube. And so one of the things that we've been doing is uh, we wanted to make the company income track big. It's a big, important track. 
and there it is. And so you get to move this giant pawn up and down it. Um, okay, so... Uh, do, 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 um, okay, so that, that that's, that's trading, and you, you trade like that. Now, why do you have riders out here? Well, the riders out here, if there's a bad war between these two provinces, uh, the, the losing province, let's say Maratha conquers Bombay, these riders are going to die. Ugh. So, you know, you, you, you usually, if you're in a presidency, you want to have a rider who's got a desk job. Um, yep, you, you have to, you're right, the geography matters a lot now. Uh, presidents always have to trade first at their port, but from there, as long as they can fill the orders, they can network in. Now, there's also, this creates more in, inter-presidential uh, rivalries because, uh, or intra, I guess, um, because if Bombay rushes off to Hyderabad, they get this contract, which means Madras can't trade in Hyderabad. They can only trade, in, they'd have to go down, down and trade in Mysore. Um, and so it, it kind of like c cuts them off. And I'm still working on some of that, some of that, that logic. Um, okay, so that's that. Uh, I'll, I'll probably give Mad Madras one of these, like a, like a connection up here. I'm not, I, I haven't figured out those, those rules exactly yet. Uh, okay, so that's how the, the things be. Now, when you attack a region, you'll note these beautiful towers taken from the Taurus mod. Uh, thank you, creator of the Taurus mod. Um, these towers indicate the strength of a region, and when you want to attack a region, you have to like the the penalty is uh, is is it's the size of these towers. Um, we are gonna do a really cool resin sculpt. If you know uh, the the Super Meeple's edition of the Mask trilogy, like Tikal and Cusco and Mexica, uh, we want that those kind of like resin stacking towers. Uh, and then the sovereignty of a region is indicated by these pieces, which will be flags. So Punjab will have one flag like on top uh, of like a little dome piece, and that will show that Punjab is sovereign. And then the nations that are not sovereign will be like sub flags. They'll be like kind of like hanging off here. I'll show you actually. What am I saying? I've got I've got a sketch, a really bad sketch that I did like 20 minutes ago. Um, oh, of, of of the uh, of the towers. Bum -bum. Um, Sorry, don't ignore okay. my elephant. Um, Incredible. Incredible. So like, <laughs> it's gonna look like you'll be we'll have cool little uh, either punch board flags maybe for the Kickstarter backers we'll do like cool metal enamel flags or something that will stick out of this dome. And, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about size and stuff like that. And then if, if a region is conquered by the company, you, you remove its strength, reduce it to a single tower, and then um, you, uh, you put the, the player piece, the, the family disc, just goes, sticks right on top. And so you know that that region is owned by a player. Or in TTS, what we like to do is, let's say you conquer Bengal, you flip it over like that, and then the writer that, that is promoted governor just gets to sit right there to show that they they rule it so uh we really wanted um yeah square pieces on octagons impossible you're right um yeah we really want like india is going to be like a focal point and, and and those pieces are going to be very fun and very imaginative um which so i'm very excited about that okay that's how the presidents work now uh factory profits so i like this mechanism a lot the company's final revenue will be located in one of these bands and so, like, this means that factory profits go down one, and then they also go up one because this is the top card of the discard pile. So the factory lobby wants two things. They want the company to do badly, and they also want certain laws to pass. And if they can do those things, their factories are going to be lucrative. But if they can't do those things, their factories could get bad, so bad that they might have to actually pay money just to keep them open. Uh, no, the, the, the flags. So some of you have probably played Napoleon's Triumph. I love Napoleon's Triumph and Bonaparte and Marengo for that matter. And I want badly more games with small metal flags. And so I'm going to be the change that I want to see in the world when it comes to there small metal flags. Um, okay. So uh, then we do trade, and so you like take these things, you, you adjust your income down for trading, all that stuff makes sense. Um, and, and you pay dividends, and dividends are paid exactly the, how they were in the old game. Uh, so for instance, right here we have like, oh, a dividend costs four. 
and you can you can spend your you know you can four dollars per dividend paid and all that stuff and then um, at the end let's say the, the company had taken out some debt what you do uh, is you have this thing called company standing so previously that's true the stickers fall off this is why we want to do a little, like if you have if you've ever had an enamel pin what I'd like to do is the flags as kind of like little enamel pins uh, so that's the that's the goal uh, but, but we'll see. I gotta, I gotta talk to my factory guy, dear, the dear Joe Wiggins, who's got a Kickstarter that's live. The Cartographer's Project. I can't remember the name of it, but it's it's a good one. Um, so the Wanderers Guild. That's what Joe's project ah, is that, called. Yeah, the, the role playing yeah, set. Uh, the, the role playing set. So um, the one of the other problems. This is in that first category for the first edition of John Company was uh, the the timing windows for um, company failure were really weird, and we wanted to make it very clear when the company fails. And so how we did that was we I created this little uh, company standing chart. So what happens is if the company t is taking a bunch of debt like this, if the company takes debt and hits the F, they fail instantly. It's over. And depending on how many dividends are paid and the health of the company, this company's standing marker will move along this track. And if it ever gets to the F here, the company fails. And those are the two ways the company fails. Those are the only two ways the company fails. Um, and I, I really like that system. Okay, we have bonuses. Uh, as I said, there's a little bit more inflow. People, like the, the company has to pay upkeep for ships now, and that upkeep is routed back to the owners of the shipyards uh, because um, the, the, East, uh, the British East India Company leased a lot of their ships. Most of their ships were leased. So we wanted to have a leasing system built in, and that's that's how the shipyard system works. Uh, then, okay, drum roll, the new event system. So the way event system works is we have um, the elephant is going to move three, and uh, we have these circle cards. These cards might be punch board, um, like one mil punch board, or they might be cards. I know people hate circle cards, but hear me out. There are only 20 of them. And we would like them to be modeled after uh, Ganjifa cards, which is this beautiful Indian trick-taking game. And I'd like to commission some paintings, and they're always done as circle cards. So there might be like 20 circle cards in this game, and I just beg your eternal forgiveness. But I promise they're going to look spectacular. Yeah, especially uh, if uh, if you know from historical sources they've been. I mean, they've been played for hundreds of years, and there's some really like interesting designs that could be used for them as well. But yeah, go ahead and flip them. Show the show yeah. how this. Is. Oh, uh, there's a question in the Twitch chat. I'm going to get to right now, which is that if the company's failing, can people rescue it? Yes. One of the things that you have a lot more power to rescue the company because this debt that the company's drowning in is going to be auctioned, and so players can start buying the debt in hopes that they're going to give the company a line of credit. So yes, there's more more rescue. Um, use poker discs, not chips. Matchstick, I don't know what a poker disc is. I'm, I'm not sure either. Okay, I'm, uh, very, I'm intrigued. Yeah, we actually, we might do metal coins. Everybody likes metal coins, and we can do them in different colors uh, for the game's currency. I'm not really sure. Um, you know... If we do circle cards, maybe I'll look to see what a circle sleeve is. I don't. That that seems like a horrible idea. Circle yeah. sleeves probably don't exist. Um, um, uh, cool. I did want to let you know that uh, afterwards, I'd like to uh, hit you with a couple of the uh, questions uh, from the Discord chat uh, right before we wrap up. Not too many though. Uh, mm, just, mm. just FYI, and letting you know that uh, it is. Uh, uh, yeah, I know it's it's nine thirty. I know. Just letting you know. Yeah, it, it's creeping on me, but we're we're almost done. Okay, so here's how the event system works. Uh, and it, one thing I'll say about, about these these event cards is we might do them as punch, but punch might weirdly wear more than cards. I don't know. We're, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It'll be great. Um, okay. So the way it works is, okay, so we have three events in India. And so you flip this and you say, hey, there is a leader born in the Sindh. And so you take a, a, a tower piece and you stick it in the Sindh. And if the Sindh is part of an empire, at the start of the game it is, it's a... Uh, part of the, the Mughal Empire based in uh, Maratha, 
uh, based in uh, yeah, Punjab, every spot in the Punjab, the, the, the event multiplies over the full dominion. And then we go to event two, flip, turmoil in Maratha. You put a little chaos cube in Maratha. And then you go again, stability check in Maratha. If, stabil if Maratha has two or more stability, lower one. If it has one or more, if it has less than two, you gain one. And that's it. That's, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Now, uh, one, uh, yeah, oh, they, no, no weird charts to, to, to do. Um, <laughs> one thing is about how the wars happen. So the way it works is there's always an elephant on a border, and that indicates who the aggressor is and who the defender is for the current crisis that is fomenting. And so if you reveal a card that is a, hold please, crisis, you look at the elephant and you compare this region's strength to its target strength. So three to two, which is higher. And you add the, the modifier on the crisis card, plus two in this case. And they're successful, which is, hey, Maratha just revolted against the Punjab and they've won their freedom. Now the elephant marches the crisis token marches and it marches to the state of bengal now you ask yourself a question is bengal sovereign or is it dependent if it's dependent the crisis will be against its owner which could be the brits or it could be you know someone else if it's sovereign it will target another nation to conquer and the way that works is you look for the little black arrow so you can see this little black arrow is pointing due east so what you do is you go clockwise from due east, boop, boop, and that means Bengal is eyeing Madras, and so they're going to go fight Madras the next, the next battle that, that happens. And that's the event system. Uh, one thing that we are doing right now is modeling it. Here, I'll show you. Um, we, uh, I'm probably going to be working on this. Py this is a Python script that simulates the event system in John Company just to prove to you that such a thing exists. I don't have one for this exact system yet, but we'll build one and we'll run it a million times and figure out how all that stuff works. Um, okay, cool. So uh, that's the event system. Uh, then we have laws. Uh, Kyle Farron likes to remark that all my games feature press ga all my games feature press gangs at some time and. John Company is no different. Uh, laws are voted on just like they used to. Some cards have uh, weather events on them, like this. Uh, and when that happens, you roll the storm die. Boom. And then that means that any ships in the Eastern Sea will have to roll a die and see if they take fatigue or are destroyed. Um, cool. And then the very last thing that I'll say, and, and you know, it's so funny, Drew, when we launch the Kickstarter, we're going to do yet like another one of these streams and I'm going to oh, talk sure. through all this stuff again. Um, but, uh, in the D the way the deregulated game works, I'll just mention very, very briefly is that if the company is doing very badly, players can opt to vote for deregulation. And if it passes, they have the ability to create their own firms, bloop, their own firms. They can have shares. They can petition other players to buy into their company. If they screw up badly enough, other players can perform hostile takeovers, etc., etc., etc. Negotiated mergers, all the magic of the of the uh, deregulated company is still here. Uh, don't worry, it's not going away. In fact, it's a lot more interesting, um, and I can talk more about that system yeah. another I think time. I think it's really funny. One of the uh, Discord comments uh, questions was that: uh, Do you ever see yourself using the mechanical bones of John Company in another time period or a different organization? And I love that you've already taken the mechanical bones of John Company and given it to the players for their the private firms as well. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. It, it, it's it. Well, and it's it's funny because I um I was playing a game of Oath recently. Oh God, I'm on my third mention today. Um, so I was playing a game of Oath recently where we had a lot of negotiation cards in play and it made the game feel like John Company. It made it feel like this really like, strange negotiation game. And one of the things I like about that design, Oath's design, is that the, the design will really change depending on how the players play it. John Company is like that. Now, I have dreams of doing a space John Company. Uh, and I actually got pretty far in thinking through this design. And then someone sent me on like Twitter, maybe it's somewhere. Someone sent me a fan John Company redraw that was like set in Masters of Orion, well, and it's uh, awesome. Drew, I can't believe I didn't share this with you. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, and so seeing that, I was like, you know what? It's already done. But oh no, I like, 
I cannibalize my own work constantly. I always, you know, like Oath's old action framework is now the action framework for the Reconstruction game. I'm always like trying. I, I don't. I don't. I like to. I like to use every part if I feel like it's a good idea. It's just not every good idea. I'm not going to try to put a a circle block in a square hole. Like I don't want to force anything. Um, yeah. Um, do you mind? Do you mind if I? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me check Twitch to make sure there are no questions here. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, you, yeah, go, go ahead. Just, oh, someone just, asked, oh. when Kickstarter? Uh, j January? February? <laughs> May? I don't know. Um, the thing well, that you should I'll, know I'll about say... Kickstarters is Drew and I are super fast. We, like, build a Kickstarter in, like, two weeks is usually how long it takes us to build it. I think, like, the, the Premier one was built in, like, four days or something like yeah. that. It was, yeah, it was it like, was built fun. in some mornings while we were at our parents' house visiting for some holiday. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... We can't do that until the game's done, um, because Drew and I are both like maniac workers, and so when it's like, okay, it's time to build the thing, we will get it. Uh, the main thing is I want to make sure the design is done, because you know, with with something like uh, with a, a game like a leader games game I'm working on, I know that I've I have the ability to catch up. If the design needs to be rebuilt, I can do it because I, it's I'm spending fifty or sixty hours a week at work. But with the with the whirly gig stuff. I only can give it a couple days on the weekend. And so I want to I want this to go to Kickstarter when it is very nearly done. And I could see a world where we get there in January or February. Yeah. And but it's like, hey, this is going to take one more round of public testing and then we're good to go. Let's just do it. But in a very real, real place it could be March. Yeah. Uh absolutely. Oh yeah, or it could be April. I mean, who knows. Uh if you want to uh get uh involved you should join the Whirly Gig Discord. It's great, and we'll coordinate testing there. Um, Drew, can you drop a all link? Of delightful people. I will certainly link in uh, in, in, in the in Twitch the chat, chat. Also in the in the uh, Discord chat for the uh, the stream that's being sent out to uh, the San Diego Historicon. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you could put that in the Twitch chat, yeah, yeah, and all the, all those places. Well, Just... I, th I think another important like question that gets at uh, one of the previous ones, which is about like your kind of roadmap that like let you, like that got you here, like this moment somewhere after like talking with. Uh, Dan Thoreau uh, with infamous traffic uh, before uh, before John Company and like the like the bits of this game that are in infamous traffic and like mm. the road leading to it involved all of these like iterations and even bits of other games before that right yeah totally um, so I, it is interesting to see the mechanical overlap um, I got another um, I got another bit here for you. Yeah, so uh, I'll I'll add, I got a question about solo on Twitch and about playtesting. Playtesting hopefully within about a month. So by early December, we'll have we'll have, be testing this on the Whirly Gig server. Maybe a little bit earlier than that. I'm not sure exactly, but soon. Um, the and and you know it's very easy to, to playtest for me. All you have to do is like ask, and then and then it happens. Um, the Solo. So what we're going to do with solo mode is we want to design in a, a small automaton, like a, a, a simple automa player that plays a family and then include two in the game so that you can play solo or you can play. So the solo game feels like the three player game or you can make the two player game feel like a four player game or whatever. Uh, this is a very different approach than the solo for the original game, mm -hmm. and I think Drew and I are gonna. I, we have some ideas about how to do it, and we'll probably ask uh, Ricky uh, R Richard Wilkins, oh. Ricky Royal, to who did the the premiere solo mode to help, and that's something that we're gonna start talking about in about a month. I want to wait till the to till a few things in the in the design harden up, um, but like right now, I would say the design is about eighty percent complete. But there, there's some squishy areas that I need to I need to figure out exactly like oh this weird thing happens in the debt auction I kind of need to fix that as soon as that stuff is tied up we'll 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 build out our solo team. Um, Drew will be dropping the Discord link in at some oh, point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me get over that. Um, Colt, someone also asked about uh, just like other recommended reading about uh, like for this game mm -hmm. the uh, recently published Anarchy. I yeah, really you should read. Like, you should read like, William Dar right, Darwin's *The Anarchy*. Right. It isn't. It's a funny book to recommend because it's really good. I mean, his stuff's awesome, 
and it's very smart. Uh, but it also like isn't. So for the for the recommended reading, um, here you go. Well, one second, I'm going to disappear from camera for a second. Let's see if I don't have to unplug my. Oh, got to unplug my headphones. Uh oh, there it goes. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, it's doing it live. Um, okay, so for recommended reading. Um, Darwinpool's The Anarchy is great, but it is uh, very smart about its perspective, and it really talks a lot about Indian politics at the period. And in John Company, the Indian politics are slightly cartoony and chaotic and ahistorical, because it's important for me to ha- for players to have uncertainty about what's happening in India. So if you know that there is this dynastic problem in the Mughal Empire, then you can take advantage of it. But the Brits at the time didn't realize that. And so it's important that India be a little chaotic. Um, now, Darwinpool's Return of a King for Pamir is a perfect recommendation because it is lined up very closely with the perspective of the players. But the Anarchy is an imperfect recommendation. Uh, what I would recommend is so uh, there's a book called um, The Honorable Company by John Key that is quite good. It's a little old fashioned, uh, but it, it, it's good. I don't mean like secretly racist when I say old fashioned. I just mean like it's a it's like a grand history in the way that people were writing those in the 80s. Um, and, it, and it's it's fine. It's solid. Um, the there's a lot of academic work, uh, including this one. This is I'm showing this to the camera, but for Discord, I'll tell you this is uh, the Trading World and the uh, the English East India Company, 1660 to 1760. Uh, don't buy this; it's very expensive. But if you have a library card, you can get yourself a copy. You can, you can check it out. Uh, it's pretty boring. Uh, one of the one of the theses of this book is basically um, the East India Company uh, took tremendous records of all of their trading that they did in the 18th century. Amazing records. But they actually didn't have um, an apparatus for synthesizing all of that data. So they were taking records, but it was useless to them. They weren't actually like synthesizing any of the data they were getting until the 20th century when we computerized it and were able to like do some studies. So weirdly, we like know more about 18th century Indian economics than like early 19th century British economics because of this weird thing. Anyway, this book's fascinating. So that, that, that will answer some questions, but actually what I really recommend is reading Victorian novels. <laughs> That's my recommended reading for John Company. Treat yourself to a copy of William Makepeace Thackeray's Vanity Fair or Charles Dickens' Dombey and Son or Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. Yeah. Um, because this is a book about the English gentry and the upper middle classes. And so, you know, read, um, why can't I think about it? The one that starts in Marseille. Oh my Lord. I'm so embarrassed. I can't remember the name of this Dickens novel. Little Dorrit. Read Little Dorrit. Right? Like those, I mean, really, like really the, the, the Thackeray is like a must, like totally. Re- I mean, Vanity Fair is amazing anyway, but like those are the books that those are my suggestions for getting for getting in the mood or just watch a period piece. There's a new David Copperfield. Watch that. Um, uh, uh, so will the region still have a personality? Yeah. Will still will Punjab still try to recreate the Mughal Empire, etc.? Um, sort of. So the, the, the personality of the regions is slightly muted compared to the old version of the game. Uh, there are structural, there are a couple places where I can adjust the personality based on the starting parameters. And we will also probably introduce a couple special events that will introduce specific characters to the game. Um, but they have slightly less, or rather, okay, let me re- rephrase that. The, the personality isn't expressed just in the events. Instead, the geography of the game and the way the chaos track is structured and the way the strength system works, that's where the personality comes out. So it's a bit of a different personality. It's a little less sharply defined and a little more generalistic, but we get a lot from that trade-off. That's a great question. Oh, which novel first? Um... Which novel first? What a great, what a great question. If you have never read a Victorian novel before, 
You should probably just read, you should probably read Great Expectations if you haven't read a Victorian Owl before. But um, I would probably start with Vanity Fair out of that set, or or maybe Dombey and Son. Dombey and Son's good. I mean, honestly, what I would start with is watch a period piece and see if it's your jam. Um, there are some people who like love Jane Austen, but then the Jane Austen fans half love Mansfield Park, half hate it. It's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> Um, cool. Any other questions, Drew? Um, uh, cool. I think that's actually probably a good spot for us to uh, wrap it up. Um, and you went over attrition. I feel like we got everything on the board. Uh, I feel like we're pretty good for uh, uh, for questions. And again, this stream went out um, uh, because we've been lucky enough to be involved with the San Diego Historicon uh, folks. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you all on uh, Discord for uh, joining in uh, and and watching the stream there as well as uh, the folks on Twitch. Yeah, I just want to you know give a thank you to um, to Harold Buchanan, uh, the designer of the brilliant Liberty uh, or Death, and uh, and the, the you know his upcoming game about the South China Sea, and uh, the the whole crew at Historicon is really wonderful. Drew and I were able to participate in it physically last year, and it was amazing. And so when Harold told, and it looked like we wouldn't be able to do it this year anyway, outside of uh, COVID, and then when Harold said he was moving it online, I really felt like we wanted to participate. And this has been a, uh, just a week of lovely, lovely, lovely conversations, and I hope you all follow their work. Um, yeah, this was great. Uh, you know, I will be giving versions of this stream again and be talking more about the design. I mean, I really went through and just picked some stuff from files. There's a lot more that I can show you. And the design, of course, is, you know, still gelling. So the next time I talk about it, some things might be, might be changed. But um, I hope that uh, this gives you a pretty over, good overview of the design. I have the, I'm very relieved to tell you that the last six or seven times I've played this game, I haven't changed any rules. And that, for folks who know, know how I work, that's... That's saying something, uh, and I'm I'm really looking forward to showing you uh, more from this game. Hopefully, the next time you see it, it will look a lot prettier too. Um, so, yep, that that's it for us. Have a lovely night and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Cole. All right, good night.